We're a well-educated group, and sometimes that's our problem. Our education teaches us to look outside, to judge other people, and we have very little chance to look at ourselves. We're good at thinking in abstractions, but we're very poor at just looking at the details of what we're doing, the results of what we're doing. what's going on right under our nose, right in our nose with the breath. So as you come to the meditation, you have to learn a lot of new skills. You come to the practice as a whole, you have to learn a lot of new skills. There's a passage where Ananda asked the Buddha, how can a person live in the Sangha, live at peace? And the Buddha's basic answer, aside from developing your powers of concentration and getting rid of your defilements, starts out by saying, focus on your own actions, focus on your own faults. Don't focus on the actions and faults of others, aside from the question of whether you can learn from them. Sometimes other people do things that are good examples, and they may be little things. Like after the storm today, a lot of the monks came out and swept around, but not everybody. But some people have that sense. You know, there's a, an event happens in the monastery that requires a lot of cleaning up, and more hands make lighter work. That's one instance of looking at others for good examples. You can look at others for their faults if you then turn around and look at yourself. And I have those faults. This is what it looks like when other people do those things, and of course that's what you're going to look like to others when you do those things. So if it doesn't look good in other people, you might ask yourself, maybe I should change the way I do things. So you look at others, find fault with others, or just examine their behavior for the purpose of turning around and look at your own and dealing with your own behavior. Because it's right in here that the problem is. When the Buddha talks about the cause of suffering, he doesn't talk about the economy, he doesn't talk about the weather. He talks about your craving, your ignorance. Where did these things happen? Right here. And it's easy to learn about the words, but it's a lot more difficult to see exactly how craving arises, how it takes over, why you give into it. These are individual matters, and they, each time they happen, they happen in a slightly different way. And it's because they have these differences that craving can keep fooling you. You think you've closed off one particular type of foolishness in the mind, you find, oops, there's another one. The cravings find another way to slip in. And so it's by dealing with your defilements one by one by one. That's how you get to know them. I was reading a book one time on the, the caves in the Laura. And the artist was <coughs> excuse me, the author was noticing that the artists in the very early caves seemed to have a very specific knowledge of the different Davis. They portrayed the Davis with lots of different personalities. And in the later caves, it became more just general concepts. Much less detailed. In other words, perhaps in the early generations, the monks actually did have experience seeing Davis, and they could tell the artists this is what they look like. And then as people got more and more scholarly and got more and more into the concepts, the direct experience went away. So there is the wisdom that comes from reading, and there's the wisdom that comes from thinking about things. But the real wisdom, the real discernment, comes from getting down to the nuts and bolts and the nitty-gritty of what you're doing with your breath right now, how the mind is able to stay established and how it's not able to stay established. And not being too quick to want to go on to the next step. 
because each step teaches you skills that you're going to need for the next. The practice of virtue, for instance, it builds on generosity. Virtue is a type of gift. It's a gift to yourself, it's a gift to others. It's a gift to yourself in the sense that you're not creating the kind of karma that's going to lead to suffering down the line. It's a gift to others in that you're not harassing them. You don't present them any danger. And as you practice the precepts, you begin to learn mindfulness, alertness, ardency. In other words, keeping the precept in mind. You have to be alert to what you're doing. You have to be ardent when you stick with the precept. All of which are qualities you're going to need for mindfulness practice. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha said the basis for strong mindfulness is views made straight, i.e. views in line with the principle of karma. And pure virtue. In other words, you hold to the precepts. Because you develop the skills that are needed in meditation. At the same time, the fact that you're not doing anything that's causing remorse or regret means you're not putting up walls in the mind. So your mindfulness practice builds on your ability to remember things way back, things you've learned from the practice in various times, because you haven't been throwing up walls in the meantime. The mindfulness, of course, gives you the skills you need for concentration. Because as you've got the mind into concentration, what are the themes of concentration? Well, the main ones are the four establishings of mindfulness. You stay with the breath. You stay with the analysis of the parts of the body. You do it in a way that gets the mind to settle down. Because the concentration is then needed for discernment. You can gain discernment from reading books, of course, without much concentration, just enough concentration to read. But to really see these things happening in your mind, you have to have, get the mind really, really still. At the same time, in getting the mind to settle down, you're dealing with what? You're dealing with the aggregates. You're going to have to be using the aggregates, or the sense media, or the properties. That's the terms that you use to anal analyze things with your discernment. Well, you get to know these things really well. What is a perception? What is a feeling? By using them to get the mind into concentration. You get hands-on experience with these different kinds of fabrication. So when the time comes to analyze them for the purpose of dispassion, you know what they are. They're not just concepts or things you've dealt with directly. And it's this kind of discernment, the discernment that deals with individual things directly in the present, present moment, that's able to see them as something separate only after having really seen them thoroughly, been with them thoroughly. That's how you get release from them. If you don't really know them on this level, there's no way you can get release. You can think about them. You can have theories about them. But the actual knowledge, the actual discernment that comes from developing the mind is needed for that kind of knowledge to really dig into the mind, and dig things out, to free the mind. So we're not dealing with abstractions. We're dealing with specific events right here, right now. And you have to be right here, right now, consistently in order to see how things are connected. And where are they connected? They're connected right here. If you're going to be finding fault, find fault with the fact that you're not here yet. Work on that. And don't try to skip over the steps. Because there are no unnecessary steps in the practice. They're all there for a purpose. The Buddha didn't have an eightfold path because he liked the number eight. It was because these were the factors that were needed. He had the triple training. Again, not because he liked the number three, but because virtue is necessary for concentration to be solid. 
and for concentration to be honest concentration. Concentration is necessary for discernment to be honest discernment. I mean, there are ways in which discernment fosters your concentration, and your concentration fosters, fosters your virtue. But that's only after you have some foundation. So remember, the issues are right here, right in front of your nose. So don't look, go looking too far out in front of your nose. And don't go too far in into abstractions. Keep your focus just right. And that's when you'll be able to see.